Mark Jerome chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves the Son as well. This is how we know that we love the Lord, and that we children of God, by loving God and carrying out His commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is that overcome the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater than this testimony of God, which he has given by his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts his testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him up to be a lie, because they have not believed the testimony that God has given by his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray it and the Lord will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. And I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. And we know that we are the children of God that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true by being in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. That's the first John chapter 5. Thanks, friend. That was great. Morning, everybody. Nice Morning. to be with you all again, and thank you for your kind invitation. Um, I think I need to uh, get myself sorted with this so you can hear me better. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> How's that? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good. It's all right. Okay. Brilliant. You've got, even got a bell this time. Is that for refreshments? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's lovely to be here, and thanks very much, Raf, for um, helping with the reading. It's um, it's a beautiful chapter in um, in First John, and I'm sure you've enjoyed going through. Um, sorry, is this annoying? No, it keeps buzzing. It's too direct, just put it down. Yeah. It's too yeah. direct. You have to too, direct too direct. Yeah. Put it down a bit. Yeah. Direct. Is that it? We got yeah. it. Right. Keep still. <laughs> That's better. So, um, as you will have uh, discovered, um, John is very direct in, in what he says, isn't he? And um, he puts things out really clearly, which is helpful. I um, mean, he pulls some punches, doesn't he? But it's great because you're left in no doubt as to what he's talking about. Usually, there are some um, areas which you do sort of stop and puzzle about um, as you read through it. But um, this morning, I want to focus on three things. And I've put it under the heading of victory living. So um, what I want to consider is this. Um, doesn't do that on my screen. However, we can work with this. It says conquer, how to conquer. Second one, how to uh, be certain. And then this last one, how to have confidence. So those are the three things I'd like to look at as we uh, 
go through First John and chapter 5. So, <clears throat> first thing that um, John is really concerned about doing, and we'll click on to the first one, how to conquer. First thing he wants to do is to make sure that we are clear on the person of Jesus Christ. That's a good place to start. You remember in John's Gospel that he uh, begins by doing a similar thing in that he's talking about the Word and the Word is life. He's really concerned at this point when he's writing to these early Christians that they understand who Jesus is and that he is not a figment of anyone's imagination, not some stories, not some nice person that lived once upon a time. He is an actual person who lived on earth but he is also God's son. So, so important. And that's why, if you keep that in, in front of your mind as we work through this chapter, it'll help unpack and sort through some of the things we want to look at. So the first thing we need to do is answer this question. Everyone who believes, verse 1, that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Is that a decision you've made? Everyone thinks this is a test. <laughs> Have we made that decision? Are we excited about that decision? Yeah. We've chosen. Thank you. Uh, yeah. we we've made that choice to follow Jesus. We've accepted that the only way to be right with God is to accept his offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. Romans 10 and 9 if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that he is God, we shall be saved. And so that's the primary thing that John wants to hit us with, the decision for God. But you see, as you read through, you get to the um, part where he says, well, that makes us children of God, and if we're children of God, then... Um, we love God and obey his commands. Now, I think this is an area that we get distracted on. Because as soon as we see the word commands, we think, oh, well, there's a list of things for me to tick off now. There's some requirements. Um, I can see what's set out, what I've got to try and achieve. And uh, once I've done that, I'm all good. I can be happy with myself, and I can hold my head up high, and it's really great. That is not what John is saying. In fact, further couldn't be uh, the truth. We like, to, we like to do that sort of thing because it's human nature. We like to think, well, what is this list of commands so that I can make sure I've met them? That is Old Testament theology. It is not New Testament theology. In the Old Testament, God said, if you do this, I will do this for you. But in the New Testament, God says, I am doing this for you because I love you. And if you love me, you'll want to do the things that please me. So what is it? What we are looking at is something that is relational, not a list of commands. Relational. Let me give you an example. I was... Um, I was chatting to a young Christian the other day, and I've met with him a few times, and um, we kind of been exploring because it was, it was evident to me that they didn't really have a good uh, routine, you might say, of daily devotion with God. They didn't really have that area of their life in a place that they were happy with. And so we, we'd been sharing ideas and talking things through. But it was clear this week that it's just gone that they hadn't made much progress. And I said, well, what are you doing? Oh, well, the answer comes out, well, you know, I struggle to read my Bible some days, you know. And it's just, you know, I could, I could go and find the Bible, but, um, but you know, it's just, some days it just doesn't happen. Right, okay, so we're getting all the excuses. By the way, has everybody got um, a phone that can download apps? Yes. Most people are good. Have you got one called U version? Yes. Great. Thank you. 
You're on form today, Lee. Right? <laughs> um, it is great. And, and some of the reasons that, I mean, obviously, it's the word of God and it's there. It's in your pocket. So you can do it now if you're bored with me. But if you haven't done it, then at least later go and do it because you can carry it around with you. And as you do so, there's a daily verse that pops up. You can tell it to remind you. It will pop up on your phone and remind you. So it's triggering that you need to be doing something with God's word. And there's all sorts of other things. But I said to him, download it now. So he downloaded it. I said, okay. So what's happening is you're thinking that you need to do something a certain way. You're not actually understanding what it is you want to do. I said to him, how are you reading? Oh, well, you know, I tried to, to read a passage and, um, you know, I just wasn't getting much. And you know how you go... And uh, as children to Sunday school, what's, what's the answer to this question? Jesus, it felt like that. I was getting Jesus' answers to everything that I was asking. So I said to him, okay, let's, let's do this. So let's do this together, eh? So we can pick a passage. I just went to John 1, because obviously John's gospel is a really good uh, place if you're looking for somewhere to start. And I told him to read those verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. See, the problem I have is that we expect everybody to know how to do this stuff, don't we? And yet nobody tells us how to do it. Now, you can get a Bible app on your phone, and it'll give you a plan. You can download uh, Word for Today, which is produced by Rima. It'll give you a daily devotion. It's great stuff. Do it. The more you can get in, the better. But if you want to just go to the Bible and read it, how do you do it? We just don't talk about it, do we? We just think, yeah, everybody knows that. And then we feel stupid because we don't know that. But we make out that we do. And so we just repeat this situation. So I said to him, what are you getting from this? Read those two verses to me. What are you getting? Actually, what are we getting this morning? If you, and there's no wrong answer. This is not a theology test. When we're talking about the, the devotion, we're talking about having a relationship. So you might get something completely different to me. What comes to you as you read those two verses? Just a brief thought. Yes. Brilliant. He was in the beginning. Yes. It's beyond time. That's great. That's the sort of stuff. And that's similar to what, what he said to me. You know, oh, right. he was kind of, he was kind of, Big. He was kind of beyond everything. That, and yes, that's right. So what are you starting to notice? You're starting to notice that you're getting an appreciation for who he is. You're starting to appreciate him, so therefore you're getting to know him better. And as you get to know him better, you're, up, you're building a relationship with him. Okay. So we worked through that. I said, what about the next verse? And he said, it's all things created by him. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So he's got everything in control, he said. Um, um, and there's nothing, nothing, nothing's a problem for him. Yes, that's good. Okay. So then you're, you're building a relationship now where you're understanding that he is beyond all the situations that you experience. So imagine later on, you go out into your workplace or wherever it is you are, what happens? Something comes up that you don't like. There's a bit of a problem. What do you start to do? You start to think about that time you had with Jesus in the morning. And what did it tell you about him? Oh, he's bigger than ever. Yes, he's bigger than everything. Every problem and situation, he is bigger than it. And you're starting to appreciate it because you're building a relationship with him. And naturally, you begin to love the one who is saying to you, I am bigger than all the mess around you. Do you see how it works? <coughs> and so he's starting to get what this relationship is about. And that's so, so important. So we've made a decision to follow God. And then the next thing is we build a relationship. And as we build that relationship, <clears throat> as we build that relationship with God, 
then we'll need to have uh, a proof of that relationship. And that is what flows out of what we've just been talking about. John is saying here that you do what I want you to do in your life because you love me. And it will be natural. And it will not only be natural to you to do these things, but it will be natural that everybody else notices what you're doing. And they will start to see that you have that relationship and they will want it themselves, you see? And so this is having an effect. It's not some rule or regulation that we need to focus on, this list of commands. It's believing God, having that relationship with him, which flows into a practical working out of our love for him. We just naturally do and want to do the things that he's pleased with. Does that make sense? Mm. And so then he says, he talks about this victory, then he says that this victory is your faith. Oh, you see, most of us think that faith is so important when you make that decision at the beginning. You know, you accept Jesus and say, but then what happens to faith? Do we then park it and think, well, I've got it from here, God? That would be silly, wouldn't it? No one's ever done that, have they? We often do that, don't we, if we're honest? We often think, yep, we've had the faith, we've believed, we've accepted Jesus, and then we try and do stuff ourselves. And it doesn't work. And what John is saying is, that if we want to have victory, this slide's gone on, sorry, but if we want to have victory in our lives, then it's essential that that relationship is developed day by day and that faith grows. And that faith that grows will be seen in our life. So examples for us. You remember um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? taken off into Babylon in captivity. Yep. Um, they decided, we're going to stand up for God. Or as we used to call them in our family, shake the bed, make the bed, and into bed you go. <laughs> Here they are. They've got a choice. Do they do what everybody else does, or do they stand alone and say, no, we're going to follow God's way? So they said, we're following God's way. And it almost cost them their life. It should have done, shouldn't it? Thrown into the fire should have cost them their lives, but it didn't. Because God honored their faith. He's bigger than all our mess, isn't he? It's amazing. What about Sarah? She's spoken of in uh, Hebrews 11, isn't she? As somebody who was past the age, naturally, of having children. Yet God came with a promise and said, I can do this. This is my commitment. I'm going to make this happen. And it says she believed him. She had faith enough, and it took her a while. There were some struggles. There was a bit of disbelief at first. You know, she was real. But she got there, and she believed. And now her name and the record of her belief, her faith, is in the Bible. How amazing is that? And that can be the same for you and me that we have made a decision for God. We're building a relationship with him. Flying out of that is our natural response to do the things that please him. It's building our faith because we're trusting in him, not us. And that is the thing that will overcome all the things around us that want to bring us down. See how John is just walking us through this stuff? Yeah, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? So to conquer, to conquer, we need to listen to God, develop the relationship, and then produce those things in our life. Now, we must move on. How 
to be certain. This is the second thing um, I want to consider, how to be certain. Now, um, it says here in verse um, 6, Jesus Christ, he is the one who came by water and blood. How to be certain? How can you be certain about anything? So, for example, if I was to say to you this morning, there's an elephant out in front, would you believe me? Yeah. Probably not. Probably not. How would you be convinced if there was an elephant out in front? What would you do? You could try and go and have a look, couldn't you? That would be good. If you couldn't get out there, hear noises. Hear There'll noises. noises yeah, you want something to prove that it's there. How does God set out this system of proof in the Bible? And he did it right back with Israel in the Old Testament. He said, by two or three witnesses. By two or three witnesses. And it says there in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1, and again in chapter 10, verse 9. You can look them up. And it talks about having witnesses to this fact. And that's the same principle that God operates throughout the New Testament as well. So it's no surprise when we're dealing with the validity of his Son, proving that Jesus is the Son of God, proving that Jesus is the Son of God, he is going to bring in witnesses. Now he brings in three. Now the first time you read um, the, about the witnesses, it said water and blood, and then mentions the Spirit of God. Why does it do that? It does it because he is dealing with the humanity of Christ first. And then in verse 8, he'll reverse the order and he'll talk about the spirit first and then the water and the blood because all of these three are important. So, now we need to know why they're important. Well, to prove, to prove that Jesus was a real man, we needed to see evidence. How was that evidence? Because when he died on the cross and dismissed his spirit, the soldier came, he saw that he was dead already, and what did he do? He put the spear into his side and outflowed blood and water. Evidence of human life. So number one, John says, it's important that you understand that I am talking about real things here. He is the Son of God. He also came as a human being. And the evidence of that was the water and the blood. But they also have another meaning. When we think of water, we think of cleansing. When we think of blood, we think of justice. The water has to do with our moral cleansing. The blood has to do with our judicial cleansing. What does that mean? That means that when God comes to assess everything and make his judgment, he looks at us and we're covered with the blood of Christ. He says, that judgment's passed from you. My son has paid it. How amazing is that? We need the blood to cover off the penalty for our sin. But we also need the water to cleanse us morally. We need to be fit morally as well as judicially. So that the water will speak of moral cleansing, the blood will speak of judicial cleansing, and the Spirit of God is truth. That's what John says. He is the Spirit of truth. No greater witness to those two facts than the Spirit of God himself. This is so important. 
because John is saying, I am proven to you beyond all doubt. And the greatest judicial systems in the world today have this same method. They bring in witnesses, don't they? God is saying, I have got the ultimate witnesses. The water, the blood, and the Spirit himself have given testimony. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's interesting. The point is here, what do we then do with Jesus? What do we do with Jesus? And John is very clear that we've got a choice. I was talking to um, somebody recently who um, happens to operate a business in what they call mind coaching. <coughs> and as we got talking about things, they happened to mention that one of the things they like to talk to their clients about is, you know, this um, eternal side of people, you know, there's this energy that carries on afterwards. Oh, energy, okay. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, she said, um, do you believe that? I said, oh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yes, yes, I do believe there is something eternal. And I said, in fact, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3 that God has placed eternity in the human heart. Oh, oh okay. So we, she had this big um, talk about the thing that she'd been reading, and um, I won't mention the book, but it was some other religion, um, and what that meant to her and what she was thinking about, and, and all these ideas, but she came back again to this thing, you know, um, well, you know, I, I, do, I do think that there's going to be something after life here. And, and uh, you know, and it can't all just be over sort of thing. And I said, yeah, I totally agree with you. And so, so you believe that we'll, we'll end up in a better place? Well, I said, I do believe we will end up in another place. I said, but for me, for me, there's two places you could end up. And I said, it depends on what you decide to do with Jesus as whether you go to the unpleasant place called hell or to the place God wants you to go, heaven. Because the only thing that will matter when we finish here is what we've done with Jesus. And John's so concerned that we not only understand who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God, but that he can bring us into relationship with God. We must make a choice. And so, we must push on. We must make a choice about what we do with Jesus. The last part of um, what I want to look at this morning is how to have confidence. See, in, um, <clears throat> in verse um, 15, it talks about praying, and it talks about um, essentially just you know, asking for what you want, and it'll be provided for you. Is, is that how it works? Is that how you see it working? See, we often, we often go straight to verse 15, don't we? We like that one. Verse 14, not so, not so good, because that puts some parameters around it for us, doesn't it? So, what does he say? He says here in verse 14, this is the confidence we have before him if we ask anything according to his will. Ah, oh, okay. So I can't get that flash new car that I want. <laughs> or whatever else it is that I, I think I need. <laughs> There's a parameter around it. Let me ask you this. Who is it that is listening when you pray? God is. How amazing is that, that God makes time to listen to you? And what he's wanting to do is to hear from you. Hear about all of life's 
troubles and, and problems and situations, and the good stuff too. But when things come up, and things do come up, <clears throat> how do we know whether it's right to pray for something or not? Now, let me give you an illustration. Um, about 15 years ago or so, I started to notice that I had um, issues with my eyes. And it was interesting to see different reactions from people. There were a lot of Christians who, well-meaning, would say things like, oh, you've just got to have faith, you know, and they'll be healed, and it's all good. It's actually not that helpful. Because what that does, it means that if I'm not healed, then I don't have enough faith. Ouch. Yes. So, so how can we look at that? In reality, you know, there are some things that God intends us to live with. Now, somebody said to me recently, I don't believe that any Christian should be sick. You know, God's given us the victory and we've got the power and we can ask for this healing and it's all done. <clears throat> Is that what the Bible says? No. Example, Paul said, I prayed three times for this problem to leave me the ailment of the flesh, the sickness that he had. God said, my grace is enough. And the reason you've got this, Paul, not saying that God gave it to him, but the reason you've got to have it still is that so you don't get proud. So the Bible tells us that there are times when we suffer. So how do we know the difference? For us, we had to pray about it and leave it with God. And there were some hard times through that. But we have learned so much about God and his love for us and provision for us and about each other as we've journeyed. And God has taught us things that we would never have seen otherwise. So sometimes we need to present something to God and allow him to do things his way. It's so important that we realize that. There are other times when we can pray confidently. You might say, well, what do you mean? How, how can we know that we're praying in the will of God? Well, there are areas in the Bible that are really, really clear. For example, uh, Jesus said to his disciples before he left, he said, my peace be with you. So we know he wants us to have peace. Paul repeats this in Philippians 4. You know, the peace of God that passes all understanding will garrison your heart and your mind. That is something that God wills for you and for me. And so if I'm not feeling peace, I can come to him and say, this is your will for me. Bring peace into my situation." That is a prayer that lines with the will of God. You can do that with wisdom. James 1 verse 5. Anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and doesn't chide us about it. So if we don't have the wisdom we need about something, ask God. You're asking in the will of God. And there's so many of these things. You can look through the New Testament, you'll discover you can pray specifically in line with the will of God. There are other times when it's more confusing. So what do we do? How do we respond when it's difficult? Let me, let me suggest um, a couple of things that you can do. First of all, there are two things, you might call them tests, that you might like to make with any decision in your life. Two tests. First test. Does it agree, this decision I'm making, does it agree with the word of God? If it doesn't agree with God's word, it's not a decision I should be making. That's clear. It's easy, eh? Secondly, is it morally right? Because there are some things in the Bible which allow us choice, and they're not clear this or that. They give us good guidance. 
but we don't have a definite. So the second question we need to ask is, is it morally right? Is the decision I'm about to make morally correct? Two key areas to guide us. And then, and then we can ask three questions. So if these are useful, you can jot them down. So we can ask ourselves three questions. If, they, if the decision we've got agrees with the word of God, so we're okay on that basis, and morally, it's fine, so we're okay on that basis, we're still not sure if it's right. How do we assess it? How do we assess it? First thing we can do is say, okay, what does this, what is the impact of this decision that I want to make? What are the consequences of this decision? So think about that. Secondly, we can ask ourselves, how will this decision that I make affect my character? How will it affect my character? And thirdly, how will this decision affect others? How will this decision I make affect others? So if those things are useful, feel free to use them. Let me give you an example. Rehoboam in the Old Testament. Now, David's great king of Israel passed the throne on to Solomon, and Solomon's son, Rehoboam, began to rule when Solomon died. He had a situation immediately coming to him. And the people came to him and said, your, your father, Solomon, ruled us really hard. He made great demands on us. He put huge ta taxes on us. And, and we feel like we need relief from some of those conditions he put on us as a nation. What will you do? Okay, so just l using those principles, was it wrong, biblically, for the king to exercise authority and to claim taxes on the people? Well, no, it wasn't. Because if we wind the clock right back to when Saul was uh, anointed king, Samuel had already warned the people. If you want a king like the other nations, this is exactly what he will do, and he has every right to do it. So there's nothing wrong biblically. The nation has been, uh, been taught this for a long, long time. Is there anything wrong morally? No, there isn't. God has said that you know, he's entitled to gain his taxes. Even Jesus in uh, his lifetime said, render to Caesar the things of the Caesar, whose image is on the coin. So those principles are there. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, so how does he go from here? What is the impact of his decision? What are the consequences of his decision? How does it affect his character making this decision? And what effect does it have on others? This appears to be the area that he falls down. Because what he does initially is gather in all those advisors that his father Solomon had. That's really good stuff. That's a great start, in fact. And he asked them, what should I do? And they said to him, it's true what the people are saying, and if you show some leniency now, you will win their hearts for the rest of your rule. But he didn't listen to them. And just by the way, God has put us in, in fellowships in churches like this because we can help each other. If we're making decisions just based upon the people in our own age group, we are going to open ourselves up to real trouble. They don't have the sort of life experiences that will help us. They have a limited view. It might be a good one, but they have a limited view of life. So if you've got people in your church and in your life that are godly people, that have journeyed for a long time. Sit down with them, have a coffee, talk to them about big things that are happening, and get their wisdom. I'm not saying that they will have your answer, but they will have something you can put into the mix as you pray about it. 
and it will help you. One of the biggest uh, lessons that David um, showed us was when he was being targeted by Saul. Remember a time when he was on the run and uh, Saul was chasing him with a band of men and at one time he was in the cave overnight. And then one of David's soldiers said to him, this is your opportunity. God's brought him here. Take his life and you can reign. Ooh, was that right? I mean, David had been anointed as well. God had made sure that David knew he was going to be king one day. Was this an opportunity? David says, no, this is not the right thing to do. Biblically, I will rule. I have the promise of God. Morally, it's not right. It's not right for me to take action against God's anointed. It's his job. You see, what he's saying is, circumstances don't determine my action. And sometimes we can make excuses to say, oh, everything lines up, you know, it's all meant to be. And we can get ourselves into all sorts of trouble. So please, get wisdom around you and think the thing through in terms of the Bible and in prayer before God. So what Rehoboam decided to do was get rid of the old counsellors and get in his mates. And what they said to him was, go even harder. Show them that you're strong. What happened? They left and the kingdom split. What a lesson. For the rest of his days, he had a fraction of the nation that he would have had to rule over. So all of these things are so important. Follow it through, says, says John. You can know, you can have confidence in your prayers if they line up with God and if you've sought God's view on things, bringing all these things into play. He gives you wisdom. You ask him, he'll give you wisdom. He'll give you wise advice. You bring in those that are senior in the faith and get all the help you can and lay it out before him. Now, I was going to be naughty and say our time's gone and we can't get to verse 16, but maybe some of you want, want us to deal with that? Oh, okay. Um, verse 16 is interesting, isn't it? A prayer for people. If, uh, what John is saying is, I'm not saying that you should pray for this type of person as a sin that leads to death. What is that? What is that? There's a sin that doesn't lead to death, but there is a sin that leads to death. I don't know about you, but I've heard many, many different uh, ideas around that and what it could mean. And some with good scriptural backing as well. So, for example, um, some will talk about the unpardonable sin, you know, and, but that, let's just be clear on that one. That is not what's here. The unpardonable sin has to do with two divine people on earth at the same time. Jesus, the Son of God, and the Spirit of God. Jesus was performing miracles, and the Spirit of God was working through him. And in that twofold witness, the Pharisees said, it's the work of the devil. That was unpardonable. It is not something we have a situation of today. So we can discount that one. Other people said, well, you know, there's, um, there's a situation of Ananias and Sapphira at the beginning of the church. They lied to the Holy Spirit and they were dead within seconds. Yeah, but I have a problem with that because that is a transitional period. It's very specific. It's the setting up of the church. And it has to do with the authority and purity of God being seen within the church. There are others that refer to 1 Corinthians and say about those that are sick and fallen asleep when they come to take the bread and the wine. Yes, those things can happen. And sometimes, I'm sure we have seen, do happen. Or we've perhaps heard of them happening. That can happen. But for me, when I read this, it's so important that we have the context. And the context is verse 12. 
He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. What is John writing about in this whole of this letter? It's about people that are challenging that belief in the Son of God. That is why he's gone to such lengths to say he is the Son of God. Here is the witness. Here is the proof. Now, what are you doing about him? Do you believe or do you not believe? So what I think we have here in verse 16 is apostates. People that have said, yes, we believe he's the Son of God, but they're just professing. They're not true believers. Now they've turned away from him and gone on a different path. And by the way, John is not saying you shall never pray for them, but he is saying I'm commanding you to pray for believers that you've seen sin, not heard about, not gossip, you've seen it, and you know they're true believers, I'm commanding you to pray for them, for the restoration. But it's not a command. If you see people that have made a profession and now don't follow Christ, they're against Christ, I'm not telling you to pray for them. God will deal with them. So what have we seen? We've seen that to have a conquering life we need to build it on a relationship. To be certain we can stand on the witnesses that God brings us and to have confidence in our prayers and in our decision making, we bring them under God's word and authority and use all the things that God has brought into our life to help us in a church community. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing that uh, you are to us. Thank you for your Son. Thank you so much, Lord, that you have given him to us. He came in a way that is undeniable. He paid a price that is unequal. Father, thank you for sharing him with us and allowing us to come into relationship with him. As we go out this week, we pray that you would help us develop this relationship, get to know you better, get to see you operating in our life as we trust you, as we call on you, as we align our lives with what you want. And others begin to notice that too. Give us your help, we pray. And receive all the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.